Hi everybody, before we get into the podcast there, just to let you know, we are back in Cork's Opera House on August the 22nd to open the Cork Podcast Festival. Which is an absolute honour, and myself and James are thrilled to be a part of such a great night, particularly when you have so many fantastic podcasts coming from Cork on the night and the week as well. Yeah, no, listen, it's great to be part of the podcast scene. And we have a great guest on the night too, a friend of ours, Brezzy, a mental health advocate who's got a great story. Um, among other things, he's uh, played Munster or uh, rugby with Leinster and he had a panic attack live on TV and he does his own show now around his own journey. So uh, it's going to be powerful. Yeah, he's just going to talk about his story growing up and when it all started for him in relation to his mental health and how he came through it and what he does today around it. You know, he does a lot of work within schools today and helps children to be able to cope much, much better with their own mental health and he creates programs and stuff like that and he does a lot of funding. So it should be a fantastic night. Yeah, we'll have a bit of entertainment, a bit of music and a bit of a crack as well. So I hope to see you there August the 22nd. Tickets available at Ticketmaster.ie or Cock Opera House box office. Thank you and enjoy the podcast. Thanks. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Two Narries podcast. I'm your host James and I'm joined as always by my good friend Timmy Dan. Hi everyone. John Connors, how's the farm? I'm very good. Yeah. Yeah. Great to have you here in Ballymun Axis Theatre. Yeah. You were telling us uh, great, a mecca of arts and theatre. 100%. I mean, about 10 years ago, I started like mentoring young artists and her uh, rappers and singers and actors. Myself, Damien Dempsey, Maverick Sabre, Terry McMahon and others. And uh, this place blew me away. The amount of working class people coming into one room, creating something specifically to the young men. Mm. And for rap, I mean, th- if you're looking at one area that's like the most rappers per capita, I'd say it's Ballymun in Ireland. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, just so much creativity comes. And it, there's an open door in this place. Mm. Mark O'Brien, the former creative director, and now Neve, they're just brilliant. You know what I mean? And whatever anybody wants, you know what I mean? Just walk in, there's an open door. It's brilliant. And Ballymun needed this, you mm. know. Why do you think it's such a creative space? I think one by, by having people like that, like I mean, Mark O'Brien, who's again, he's now went on to be in the Abbey. Uh, literally, the reach out stuff. Do you know what I mean? Like really reaching out to the community, and not just trying to tick boxes and get funding. Yeah. Uh, really making an actual effort, actually caring. That makes the someone at the top actually caring. And Neve now who took over, who's taken over him, is the same. They're there for the right fucking reasons. They're not a tyrannical leader yeah. who's just trying to tick boxes and get funding. Yeah. So that's the difference, I think. And then you open the door to a state-of-the-art place like this uh, and yeah. all the technology they have and everything, it's, it's yeah. the best. Uh, Any time anytime we're looking for space to come up here, the door is yeah. always open. And reasonable yeah. prices and everything like that, like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. If even a price. Do you know yeah, do you know what I mean? Do you know what yeah, yeah I exactly. There's well, it's same with me. You get me a load of freebies with things like yeah. that, what I wanted yeah. to do if it was something that is good and nutritional yeah. for the community. You know what you I mean? Love, you love always kind of return the favour. Yeah. But listen, John, this is our second time around. Yeah. The first time we done it below in the studio in Cork and, you know, and I, we were chatting about it beforehand and it was one of the most powerful podcasts we had and this will probably outdo it here. Yeah. Had technical yeah. issues and the nice. Yeah. You know? Quote. Yeah, no, I remember it. Like, I, I told my friend Teddy there was the best podcast I yeah. ever did. And uh, if it was an average podcast, I probably would have walked by raids and gone, fuck the lads, <laughs> even though it wasn't your fault. Yeah. But because it was so great of a conversation, I went, I, f- I felt great yeah. driving away from you that day. Anyway, like. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I knew we'd do it again. You yeah. know what I mean? So and here we are in Ballymun, near my hood. Like. Yeah, sure. yeah, we were delighted to have you on because, uh, you know, when you're commenting on our stuff and sharing our stuff, it doesn't go unnoticed. You mm. know what I mean? So yeah. we were delighted to have you on. So it's great to be here. Mm. But we're going to bring it right back. Just tell us, about, you're sitting not far from here. Where are you from? What was it like growing up for yourself? I'm from, well, I'm born and I was born in London. Yeah. And uh, this is obviously stuff we went through before. We go, I act like we haven't. <laughs> but, yeah. but I was born in London. And the reason why I was born in London, uh, a fact that my brothers would never let me forget, uh, is because my father... Uh, who was a schizophrenic, he hijacked a taxi one day and um, he went straight into the wall and broke his hip and he got put on armed guard um, in the hospital. And my mother had been engaged him for like two, three years at that time. Big long engagement was for travellers. Mm. About to get married. And uh, she visited him in the hospital and decided to escape him out the window. And uh, they went on a ferry to England and met up with <laughs> met, met up with me mother's uh, sister and she was married to Purcell over there and all the family and he met up with his McCarthy uh, cousins and that and uh, so they went over there and they were there for a couple of years and then I came along um, and I was born in King's Cross in London 
and before it was one, I came back. Uh, but that's the mad thing. That was one of the things that shaped me. Like, uh, he, like uh, we can joke about it, but I always felt less than Irish. It was a weird yeah. one because my two brothers were born in Dublin, yeah. and we had like dislike like about it. Oh, you sure lads! I <laughs> I won the Four Nation gold medal for Ireland, beat an English man in the final, who said he was going to knock me out. You paddy cunt, right? And I showed the lads and I broke his ribs and I showed the lads the tape of it, me two brothers, and he says, you should be fighting for Britain, you bastard. <laughs> so, like, you never win with the guns. Yeah. But I'm glad it happened because it shaped me and shaped my whole world view. Yeah. And it no. made me really interested in yeah. Irish history and Irish culture. And I became fucking more Irish than them in that way, you know what I mean? And I wasn't alone because I had like 52 first cousins that grew up in, in, in the camp when yeah. we came back to Kulak. So 52 first cousins, then probably 20, 30 second cousins and 12 aunts and uncles, grandparents, friends and family all in like basically a reservation. Yeah. And so with like 20 of us at least were born in England and we'd be the English bastards. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what, today, ye yeah. 20 yeah. have English passports yeah. today and no. they're invaluable. I don't, I don't. I would, no, yeah. I couldn't do it, man. <laughs> but they're there anyway if you it. ever went to them. Yeah, they're you there if you need they're good for certain kinds of things. It's yeah. worst passport in general in the world to have because they're an imperialistic bastards and not the people, but just the elites, yeah. uh, like all the other European elites. But for certain, yeah. getting into certain countries as well and the Commonwealth and all that stuff. But no, I'd, I'd never get away. I couldn't yeah. live it up, lads, if I got a British passport. But what was it What was it like, you know, going back to the, the, the days when you can actually remember growing up inside the, the site with the lads and mm. the cousins and stuff? How was it with your mum and dad and everything else? It was it was fucking brilliant to be honest with you. I'm fucking I'm I'm over the moon that I had that I was that last generation. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Before social media, before everything, yeah. and for you know lots of things changed for travellers. But I had a father who was a great father. Like he was schizophrenic, but he was like uh, kind of eccentric and like unbelievably smart. His nickname was the the professor, and in ways he was kind of an outsider w among the traveller men because he just taught outside the box about everything. You know. And he had me, like I met, recently met me, uh, me play school teacher, uh, Miss Moore. And she called me over, I hadn't seen her in like 30 years. And I was like, man, like 25 years, whatever, whatever it is. And she said, come over, come over. I was telling me, husband about you. You and your brother Joe, you were the f so freaky because you could read before you could walk. Because <laughs> my father taught us how to read yeah, yeah. before we could fucking walk. Literally, we were reading newspapers. So like it was like mad. He was like mad like that and he'd always teach you things like, you know, always ask questions, never just take something. Critical thinking. Yeah, always think outside the box and go, why are you saying that? You know, and uh, always stand up for what you believe in, always. Mm -hmm. You can fight to the dead for that. So that them kind of things, like it's mad, the, the, those sort of echoes never left me, mm -hmm. all like throughout my life. And sometimes I took it real literal and sometimes more sometimes symbolically. It you in trouble. But I did, it got me in trouble as well, like like even the never back down from the fight. Yeah. Yeah. That was a hard one, yeah. <laughs> especially when you grew up where I grew up and you're in the middle of Darndale and Kulak and you're surrounded by traveller sites one side, Darndale the other side. And you have to fight the whole way to skill. Yeah. But you have to tough. be tough. Yeah, it's you have, have to be tough. Be, you yeah. have to be tough to be able 100%. to do it in the You have to be. It's as simple as you grew up in a similar area. Yeah. But for us, we had a kind of unique thing in that because uh, uh, it's a, it's an awful truth, but it's the truth. When you grow up without a father as a traveller, there's an extra edge to that. You're seen as uh, victims to to other travellers and like because everything is about who's the father and could I get away with doing something if 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 he's this or that or the other but if you have no father it's free reign to do what you want there's mm. no comeback there's like. no comeback so me and my brother Joe got a lot of bullying like from kids around age but older that was the ones you, you'd be more worried about and then emotional the emotional stuff and yeah. and, and the kind of the, the, the belittling and denigrating like so we would have been looked at by some of the older men in the camp of like oh, I'd never let my daughter marry one of them and you'd hear things like that mm. because you don't know how to make a living They're, they'll never be real men because like, they've no father so that stuff was worse than the, getting the shit kicked out of you that's where when you were younger yeah, so like at eight, like my father tried to commit suicide. Look, I can't get the word out, commit. I was still saying it. Like, it like it's a crime, but yeah. Yeah, it's just a, a church thing. It's a weird it? thing. It's a weird thing and I still, every time I say it without thinking, that's the way it comes out. But It's a sin in the eyes of the church. Do yeah, you, and it's a crime. Yeah. Commit, you know yeah, what I mean? Uh, you know, growing up, if, for me, even the word suicide, you know, you know, the way adults talk about suicide, and this is years ago, no, I don't know, can you relate or not? But, you know, People would always say um, suicide was the easy way out, the cowardly way out. You know, people didn't understand it back then. They didn't. You know, my own mother took her own life. My mother's partner Sorry took her own one. life. I have plenty of family members. But because of my own mental health years later um, and the stuff that I went through and the 
it's hard to have taken my own life and come across a few times and, and you know I understand no like it's it's not about anything else it's just it's pain it's pain that human beings are not made to be able to take you know and that's why people it's not a way out it's just people just, just break they get to a place and, and they just can't take it no. it's a threshold it's not they reach a threshold it, like. years ago we used to call it different things or whatever you know but it's it's not like that at all it's just it's, it's something that just happens and nobody will know why it happens but some it just happens and, and there's not there's no real answer to it it's just it's pain and, it's and, pain yeah and that's it I think uh, people say that are silly because it takes some fucking balls to kill yourself yeah. balls like fucking gorilla balls to kill yourself because I came close a few times and I backed out yeah. uh, one being afraid two me mother what would happen to me mother like yeah. if I you know I listened to me mother cry for years through the ball in the trailer after me father died through suicide and imagine me doing that where like she's dead basically straight away mm-hmm. if I do that me brothers what it made me out brothers yeah. the closest brothers in the world uh, my father tried it a lot of times I caught him one time and then he uh, he went into a mental hospital like we used to we used to go and visit him in the mental hospital yeah. and we thought it was a dojo and he was learning martial arts <laughs> and everybody went along with us you know what I mean so we'd go in and we'd sign out and, uh, and never forget we did this mad journey with the the, the the bus from Kulak into, into town then we get the train from town out to Balbriggan and we'd walk from Bal- near enough Balbriggan Dunabayet then we'd walk from Dunabayet down to Port Ran and then we went to the mental hospital and we were going to meet my daddy who was like nearly gets a black belt now mm. and this is like for years like you know <laughs> he never got the fucking black belt <laughs> but uh, but the staff would go along with him they'd play along fair play to him you know what I mean we didn't know at the time like obviously <laughs> you know but uh, we're walking down and I remember remember one day we walked down walking down and the staff was bringing us down and my mommy's there and uh, we get excited he was in because they still had the the bars you know the bars they had in the, in the cells yeah. and the padded cell with bars yeah. that's what he was in oh. But he was in all this white clothing, so it was like a cr- craddy. Yeah, you know what I mean? So, but he'd know we're coming, so he'd be there in like a yoga position, like that, nice nice clothes, right? Oh, and then he'd go, John Owen Joe, and we go, how do you know? You know, this is, you know, how do you know it's us? And then he'd jump, ah, bah, and do all the moves. And uh, then we go out the back and play out the back, like, so we were like, when are you getting your black belt? And then even I remember now, I remember there was an old Chinese vein in there, and he he just bowed to the Chinese vein, like, he's the, 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 yeah, like he's the fucking sensei. And we were like, there's a sensei, there's a Miyagi guy, we be weak, like, but we'd understand why he has to stay there to get the belt. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but then him and mommy would have that tug of war, and obviously, obviously, like, you know, he, she knew, you know, it's very taxing on her and us. And then he'd go back and he'd be grand for a while and then but then he just tur- like like he'd just turn into a different human being. Like he thought he was different people. Like I remember he'd there was a an IRA man by the name of Dominic McClinchy. Do you remember him? Yeah. IRA man up the north, blew loads of people up. He, he thought it was him. Like and he'd do All right, lads, come over here and yeah. And all and mm-hmm. then, another day he'd be Terminator. Like literally oh, yeah. he'd be like think he was Terminator. What was it? A split personality disorder? Yeah, I think there was multiple I don't think he was fully diagnosed one that was schizophrenia and yeah. oftentimes there's multiple. You know yeah. what I mean? Because they're closely related. It's like we're going to one or the other. Yeah. So um, he would do a lot of that and we'd, we'd, we'd be like, very, it'd be funny sometimes and sometimes it'd be very very yeah. fucking scary like and my mother would be terrified, you know. So he he ended up going back out of the mental hospital after I found him trying to uh, overdose with pills and then we moved back into the camp finally. We left the flat. Mommy said we have to bring it back to my people into the camp and, and uh, so one day I was out in the backfield and I heard him call me and he said, John, oh, John, come here to me, son, come here to me, son. And I was going, Daddy, where are you? And it was, this went on for about 10 minutes. And I went into my mother and I said, Mommy, I said, Daddy's out in the backfield. And she's like, no, he's not in the mental hospital. You know what I mean? What she didn't know was he actually escaped out of it, got out of it or one way or another. And an hour later, the guards came in and we were in their dinner and the guards came in and told us that he, he was found um, in, a, in a lake, drowned. The lake of his secondary school that he went to that he used to bring us to play in the woods. So he kind of threw himself in the river. He couldn't, he couldn't, um, couldn't swim. So that kind of, that that's the big change in my life when that happened. That left you vulnerable then? Yeah, it left us vulnerable to kind of people who just, yeah, looked down upon us and all that. So, but it did make us tough, but like, it, it, it made me repress so much. And I hated him then, like, I hated him. Like, once we started getting bullied, I hated him. And I loved my father more than anything, yeah. like. 
But I went, fuck him, like, mm. he left fucking left us, like, and uh, you, had some, at, you had had to blame someone for your had pain. had to blame somebody, and looking at my mother and going, she has to do it all alone, like, it's not fair, like, my mother, uh, I love, there's no one I love more in the world than my mother, times 10, no one else uh, compared to her, like, but what she went through, so, so it was rough, and we had a few years, and I was getting bullied left and centre, like, black eyes every day, uh, mm. to and from school, and then fighting settled lads in school, and then, Getting segregated, putting an all traveller class, even though me, me and my brother Joe were academically very bright, until we told my mother about it then, and she went over and kicked the fuss up, and we went back into the general population. Mm. Uh, there used to be an all traveller class in the primary school. Then. Yeah, there was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was an all traveller class, and then there was another class um, that you had just all the fellas that were messers or just yeah. couldn't sit in the normal class. A lot of them fellas later on would have. Came out like they would have had some some something wrong with them, mm, you know, ADHD, yeah. the dyslexia, but it wasn't diagnosed back then. But you had a traveler class, you had a messers class, and you had your three or four normal classes then. Yeah, well, we used to we we went into the class the first time. I never forget the teacher, Mister Holbein. He gives us a uh, crayons, and I said, "Crayons? Well, what are we doing with crayons? Like, it means always reading newspapers at two years of age, three years of age." Like, he gives a crayon. I said, "Can we get a little book we can read or one?" He said, "Oh, you can read." It, like, it reminds me of that scene in Life. Did you ever see Life at Martin Lawrence and Eddie yeah, Murphy? But yeah. he go in and get the pie. And he says, hey, Roger, could I get some of that pie? How do you know my name? You can read? You know, this level of ignorance. And he's, he gave us Huggy Bear. And I said, well, Mr. Hoban, I was reading this in second class. See, because what was common practice was you do second class with, uh, uh, you'd stay up there with the general population up in the second class, you do your communion. And then the third, then they'd put you in an all travel class. This is the pattern I've seen all around Ireland. Right. Like, um, so... He was like shocked though you can read on. We were reading it. He was like, oh, really good. Look, read whatever you want over there. Blah, blah, And it was like no good, no guidance yeah. and a free for all. Like, and it was just, you know what it was, lads? It was so embarrassing mm. because me, we had all our friends like in a real class, like other kids and whatever. And yeah, we got called a pikey or knacker by one or two of them, but most of them, like still to this day are my friends. Yeah. Like we went to school from four years of age together and we're still friends to this day from Darren, they're like cool, like and prize yeah. and Clun Shock. So, when we all of a sudden got put in that class, me and Joe, we were fucking so ashamed. Like, and the lads were going, "Why are you all together there?" Because like you're putting him in all travels of all ages, from just thirty six of all ages, generally put in there. So, so I got, I got, a lot, I got fucking very angry it's with that. Like, like, yeah, Midwest. yeah. He talks a lot. This is still going on, like. Yeah, well, varying degrees. I know, I know, it's still going on now. Even with, they're reduced trying to timetables. Yeah, reduce time timetables, and all. It's another way of doing it. But even. Even travellers are still properly segregated. Two years ago in some places in Wicklow, I heard. Uh, it didn't stop. Like, And I'm only 33, lads. Like, I'm not talking about Alabama in I the know. 50s. And I'm being black. Like, I'm a traveller who grew up in the 90s. 90s exactly. You know, we're right up to the, right to the early 2000s. So. We had a podcast there for last year with Patrick McCann. Do you know Patrick? Yeah, I do know Patrick, actually. Yeah, Patrick's from Fingless. Yeah, he yeah. came over from Manchester. Mm. Two different sides, Dunsing Clan, Hulak, mm. I think. Yeah, he would have been, yeah. He said that it was lucky he was able to fight because he was able to protect himself and his family because he was into the boxing. Mm. Did you go into the boxing? Did that help you kind of yeah. stand up? And so normally, like, you know, the mad thing about travellers, it's one of the great things is the, is the boxing culture because, like, Ireland ha has been consistently in the top 10 boxing countries in the world for the last 20 years. Every other country in the world has at least, that it, it, that's in that top 10, has at least 10 times our population. Mm. So that proves the fight in Irish thing. Yeah. yeah. Now... Travellers make up 0.6% of the population of Ireland and they make up sometimes up to 50% of the champions. Mm -hmm. So that's like fucking mad. Yeah. And that's the culture. Yeah. But the thing is, the culture is getting driven by the men and the fathers. But I didn't have a father, so I didn't get put in boxing. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? But I was looking around when you were all going into boxing and I'm getting the head punched off me every day. And I went, I have to go to boxing. I think I actually remember watching Rocky one time. And I said, that's it. Yeah. That's Rocky. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Me and my brother Joe watched Rocky every single day. Rocky 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Every day. We watched Rocky 3. We watched it so many times. We said, we'll start counting the many times we watched this. So we watched it every day for a year. Rocky 3. Yeah. Just put it on every day, you know? But uh, so I went, I went to the boxing club and I said, fuck it. I went with two of my old friends that I grew up with, old Patrick Gavin and Terence Gavin, I think it was. And we went up and... Um, and they told us, uh, Joe Russell, who was a real old school Sheriff Street inner city. Remember Mickey from Rocky? Yeah. On steroids. <laughs> and like, PC, anti-PC, oh my God. Uh, but he said, uh, he said when we walked in, this is your first night and your last night. You can get your jackets and fuck off out of here. And I said, okay, geez, this is intimidating, right? So we go out for the jog and I'm kind of a half chubby fella at the time and trying my best to keep up a jog, but I'm putting a lot of effort in. 
I go back to the club and I'm hitting the pads. And uh, he's seen something in me. And he said, you can come back Wednesday. So I went back and we hadn't, it's mad because success breeds success. Yeah. Darndale had a great uh, history of boxing, but he hadn't won an all Ireland title in probably five years. So I went into it and within six months I won the league title, the Dublin title, the Leinster title, the all Ireland title. Okay. Within six months. And then we start getting all all Ireland champions. And like the amount of travellers in that club, like we ended up being the best club in Dublin for 10 years in a row. Leinster seven years in a row. Uh, three times best club in Ireland and uh, I was a part of that and did you stay there for? I did yeah well, you, you, but you, like, you come across as a really intelligent man John as well and I think boxing is not just about all brawn oh, and boxing is a lot of intelligence big time boxing has problems all of them yeah like my, my small lad Jay since the last time we were chatting he, he joined boxing and um, he's a smart kid and I see how fast he's after taking up the mm. boxing Oh, he was in an all Ireland there for a f- few months ago. He got robbed. <laughs> so I just, it happens though. He got robbed. Happened to me. East. But anyhow, we we won't be bad about it. Um, but I seen that he was a smart kid, but he also had he had it about him, like, and he was good, you know. Yeah. And he's 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 doing really well. Yeah. Did you know? Did, were you that? Were you really? Were you listening to your your coach? Were you smart about the boxing? Did you pick? Yeah, absolutely. But I was also my own worst enemy too, because yeah. I had so much rage in me. Like uh, like the best performance I ever gave in the ring was actually a show fight. It wasn't even an important fight. And I did all Ireland's one day, all that four nations. <clears throat> the best was one day I was fighting a fella and he was two weight uh, weight categories ahead of me in a show fight in Crumlin. And he was also a four time Irish boxing champion. And my trainer Joe said to me, Joe Lawler, one of my trainers, um, he was an Olympian. He said, John, you know, just for the crack, will you do me a favor, please? I said, What, Joe? He said, For the first time ever, will you just use your brain? in the fight you know because I just wanted to go forward and aggressive now with a good job that saved me from getting sloppy he said just use your brain he said you know what go on the back foot and fight him on the back foot and I gave your man that bad of a bait and that they called the, the first round after a minute the second round after 40 seconds and the third round after 30 seconds because it was crumbling they were cheating bastards because I would have stopped the cunt but I gave him an absolute and me, and me friend this is a brag to say but my old friend Fraggle and my cousin he said Johnny you were like Sugar Ray Robinson because <laughs> you've never seen that side of me you know but I'd show it in time to time in sparring yeah. and I was like Jesus I should have done my whole fucking career like that yeah. and then I ended up having a big fight against a shade I fought it was from Wicklow and it was in the semi-final of the Intermediate All-Ireland I was like one of the youngest people in the whole competition I was 17 so it's, it's the youngest you can be to get into it but most 17 year olds don't go in it mm. unless they're cleaning up in the, in the underage mm. and uh, and I looked across the ring and I saw the size of the thing right <laughs> and I was it was 91 kilos but I was only weighing in 88 kilos you know what I mean and he would have been coming from probably 100 and he was 30 years of age I said I'm done with this fella right so I just used the jab and I only threw one right hand in the whole fight and I bet him 19-1 just with jabbing jabbing yeah. and the very last punch I hit him was a right hand I never even threw the right hand. Yeah. So I've had a listen more, you know, that kind of way. But uh, It's a great sport. It's know? a great fucking sport. It's great for children, yeah. you know. Like, my trainers, to me, they're fucking humanitarians. Mm-hmm. Like, they never got paid for doing this. Like, all boxing trainers and amateur clubs, they're saving kids from the streets. Like, I don't, I couldn't even estimate how many, how many children he, he saved. Joe Russell, Joe Lawler, Jerry Hanlon, in Darndale, in Darndale as well. In the middle of the heroin. He started that in 1975, and he's still doing it. He's still the trainer. Never got a penny his whole life. Yeah. And Joel Aller and George Jerry Hanna. They're terribly underfunded as well, the boxing clubs. Yeah. They're not funded at all. Yeah. They don't get funding yeah. at all, my club, my club Darndale. I still call it my club because it'll always be yeah. for me, like, uh, because it was a place there, place where you could fucking, you could find catharsis. Do you know what I mean? Like, and they would, and they would, they were coaches in life and they would teach you things and they stopped me from, Going down, like, I, I got in some mad shit in my teens in Darnell, and I ain't going to lie about it, and violence and lots of mad stuff. And my skills that I had was seen as a strength on the street, put it that way, yeah, by people, yeah, yeah. you know? Uh, but it would have went way worse only for them because they were constantly pulling me back into the ring. Do you know what I mean? Like, and they were, like it'd save, save your life, like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, the old boxing is a great sport. So, John, just go back a small bit, right? Say maybe from... Your your early teens. Mm. What were what were what were things at this stage in your life? You know, your dad was dead. You were doing a bit of boxing. Mm. How were you getting on? Once I found boxing, um, I got confidence because I had really low self esteem. Uh, so I started getting really fucking confident. Like, and I lost a lot of weight, and I got in really good shape. And uh, I didn't realize I was a fucking natural athlete. So I was mm. just an, 
I won fucking all those titles in boxing. I won things in football. I, I won five gold medals in one there, in one year in in, um, in um, athletics, all different five gold medals and a silver, which pissed me off because I was that fucking aggressive of a competitor. Like, so just once I hit twelve, I kind of went. You know, puberty just treated me well. It was like fucking big doses of the testosterone. I'd say, but uh, I, I I just was. I had an unquenchable appetite for winning. Like obsessively, and I got unbelievably disciplined. Like, and like we had a camp gym. We built a camp gym. Well, actually, I won't say we built it. The lads built it while I was boxing in the Four Nation, my cousins and my brothers, <laughs> and they built it for all of us. And we'd like we train lads. We just we just decide, we'd be up at two o'clock in the morning. We just decide, right, let's do a three hour training session yeah. in the camp gym and put on fucking the Rocky soundtrack. Yeah, like we genuinely do that. Like you'd go right, let's do a jog. Let's see how fa- how fucking fast we can do five k. I think we did it in 15 minutes one time or something like that. Like 15, 16 minutes. We were just lunatics. Then you go to boxing. Six days a week we were training in the boxing club. We are training outside of it. So it was just obsessive. Like obsessive. And 16, I'd say, was about the age where that obsession started started to stop. And women and, yeah, you know, I discovered nice. women before that, but, yeah. but in 16 I was hitting my peak. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've ever went back there. But uh, then you're starting to drink and you're hanging around Darndale and you're going to swords to this bureau and you're, yeah. you're over there and you're eating kebabs and, but you're getting away with it because you're 16. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But then when you hit fucking 18, it's different. Yeah. And then I went into a fight. Ah, oh, fuck me. It nearly killed me. Fought my last fight and uh, first of all, that intermediate I was telling you about, I went to the final of that and I fought another fellow, Willie Byrne, who was like 27 or 8 at the time and, and he beat me in the final by f- only a few points, only a couple of points and I had a bad flu going into it as well, very bad flu and my trainer wanted to pull me out of it, I said never, um, went into that and then I went next year doing the under 19s and a fiend bet me that should have never bet me and that's what disgusted me but I trained just for six weeks after not training for about six months at tennis elbow and thought I'm just going to steamroll him yeah. and it's when my, co- my my confidence went to arrogance total arrogance and I walked in as a red hot favourite like, and I, I went in in the semi-final and knocked I fell out in probably 30, 20 seconds like rendered him unconscious and I said I'm going to do the same to this vein and he went in and he boxed the brains out of me. Buster Douglas yeah. moment, didn't it? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. He boxed the brains out of me. And he went in thinking he was going to lose. Because we fought in the Irish team together. Yeah. And I was he used to kill him in sparring. Like, he couldn't even spar me. And he went in and I got what I deserved, which was a nice little nasty boxing lesson. And I just was reaching and going, what the fuck? My time and everything was gone. Yeah. And then I went, right, I'm... I'm, I'm it, I'm going to get back to it now. I'm going to do it normal, blah, blah, blah. And I got involved in street stuff and then bare knuckle fighting, you know. Uh, that got in the way and breaking hands off that and doing all that shit. I don't regret that, to be honest with you, because the fellas at bet were the bullies, do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? The fellas that bullied me as a child, basically. Did, did any of those bare knuckle fights get out of hand where they weren't just left the way it's supposed to be? Funny enough, they all resolved the issue, but there were big things beforehand. Not all of them. The, the first one we were feuding for years like I lads I I was in a feud at 13 years of age you know I was told I'm not going to say by who but I was told to go in and grab you know they hid someone hid a shotgun in uh, my mother's trailer I was told to go in and get it and I was 13 and we were we were surrounded by ERU the emergency response unit the whole side was and uh, I went in to get it and, and they told me there was no bullets in the gun and uh and I was a big John Wayne fan. I love John Wayne and Clint Eastwood and all like obsessively like. So I was like, "How?" You see the movie in yeah, Twins early. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was holding the gun and I was just holding. I was inside the trailer. I grabbed the gun in the back room, and I put the gun up against the just up against the wall like that. You know what I mean? I was just prep and I went, "Ah, sure, there's no bullets, right?" And I went, "Bang!" Big hole in the trailer. Shades came down. Shades were terrified. Me mommy and all and all my aunts came around. Ah! Me child, uh. <laughs> and they managed to convince the shades that it was the other family we were feuding with that shot over the ball and blew the hole in the trailer. But it was like a hole, like because I shot it up close with a big shotgun. Mm. And I went over, I'm <laughs> going over to my grandmother and darned old Margaretha McCarthy, married Connors, obviously. She, uh, she came on, she was real soft. Come in, son, come in, hugging me and kissing me. And I said, over there for about a week, it was ready my life. But then I was back into the feud, like back into. January 13, that stage. 13, yeah, I was back into the feud, back into like going toe to toe, fans out in the streets. 14, at 14, I was going toe to toe with like adults in the street and bait them. Yeah. And weapons, like uh, monkey so, rinses, you know. You're involved in that. Are you walking around 
confident with a swagger or are you walking around full of fear looking over your shoulder uh, walking around terrified acting confident yeah yeah absolutely yeah, terrified perfect answer there absolutely terrified uh, like and it's same with the ring like when I yeah. when I <laughs> when I used to be uh, when I used to be in the dressing room to go in to find the ring right the lads all in the club used to say Jesus like Tono you're like as, you're as cold as ice you get more nerves and it was only because my training was the bullying they concealed the fear. I was acting. Yeah. That was my first acting. I acted like I was fearless. Mm. I was a brilliant actor, but I was terrified. Mm. And when I was in them dressing rooms about to go out in the fight spots, I was saying to myself, what are you doing to yourself? Mm. Why are you putting yourself through the stress? You're going to be killed now in front of everybody. Like You're going to be a meta show of like, what, just quit boxing. Every time I fought, I was telling myself, you need to quit boxing. It's too stressful. Like, yeah. And it was even worse out in the street because it could go way worse. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, a bad things happened. Like, you know what I mean? So, and then the, all those fellas, it ended up getting really fucking nasty and we had to move. Like, and then we moved up to another area. And then they actually, this family, they, they found me in the, I was walking down Darndale Road one time and I was four, 13, June 2003. And they chased after me in a van and they all jumped out. But I was so fast by that point. Like, I was the same height I am now at 13, but so fucking fast. And I ran like fucking Forrest Gump, boys. And I ran back to the camp, right? But when I got back to the camp, my face was all drooped. I got fucking Bell's palsy. Do you know from the fright? Oh, fuck. Yeah, man. got Bell's palsy from the fright. I ended up getting it twice more in my life. One more for another stressful incident as well in my late teens and then later on for something else but uh, so there was all that there was a lot of there was, I saw a lot a lot of violence a lot of violence I was involved in a lot of violence I got a nice few pains myself um, did you break the cycle of violence? Fuck me man I don't know if it's, I don't know if I'm breaking it yet to be honest because time, it, don't it? Is, yeah, because it, it, do you know what? that will always be with yeah. me as well to yeah. react in, in the appropriate way if yeah if, if, if you're being maybe challenged. Yeah, just, let's say exactly. That. So if someone comes up to you with a fucking hatchet or, or whatever, like you're not going to lie down on the floor and no. start crying. No. Do you know? Well, the, the, you have it already. You, you know? have, it, like, you have to there's do. a certain moral code I'll always carry anyway. Yeah. I'll always have, uh, and that comes from the bullying, that comes from no one's going to denigrate me. Yeah. And there's certain things that I will, I will just access the psychopath in me and go, I'm willing to die in this moment. Mm. I'm willing to die if I have to. And that's if you harm anybody belonging to me. And you notice this pattern with anybody who's been harmed or been bullied. When you touch people they love, they're even more raised because it's like, hang on, I took enough. You won't be doing nothing to anybody belonging to me. And like I was even with my niece, my nephew was there last night and this morning teaching the boxing. And they're catching on really good. Like they're fucking, they're deadly, you know. And even the thought of someone bullying, because I'm looking at them and they're, I remember me and my brother Joe was that age and the bullying we were getting if someone bullied them boys yeah. because you're bringing Hanna, yourself back to, to Hannibal Lecter yeah. but you're bringing yourself, yeah. you're bringing yourself back to your yeah. own pain and you don't exactly. want them to feel that and, and look at how beautiful they are now yeah. how pure they are how and so yeah. vulnerable they are uh, you know especially one of them like he's real quiet like real introverted and the other fellow's real extroverted you know and I'm going, God help us, lads. There's so much I'd put hands on. I'm like, poor child, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You think how fucking, how many fucking maniacs there's out there, boys? Do you, know, do, do you know that kind of stuff there that when Dan is a, a child? Mm. A lot of fear in that stuff, John. Oh, you know, God. You that. How do you deal with, with, with that stuff today? Do you understand it? Oh, I totally. I've analysed myself inside and out, and I have the benefit of having fucking one of the most qualified mental health experts in Ireland as we fucking want to be best friends, like. Yeah. So um, I've analysed a lot of that, and I know, I know how. I react to things and where it comes from. And that's why I have an internal dialogue all the time and how I communicate to people. And don't be projecting upon, onto people. And don't be just going, that's what they meant, you know, that overthinking, that kind of metacognition. I kind of have to stop myself all the time. And the fear, the fear never goes away, boys, you know. Oh, and the fear, and it's, and it's like, it manifested in other shit on, like, you know, with me controversies online and whatever. And it's a very nuanced conversation to have, but people would never understand it. But like, you know, at times where I, I did stupid things myself, but people come after me and it's like, I can't back down. Mm. I can't back down. Like, yeah. I feel like I'm getting bullied again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I'd rather die than get bullied or face it because it's like this, the fear in itself is fucking crippling. Mm. So I have to face the fear straight on mm. because it's so fucking crippling because it's like, that's the worst place to be in the corner just going, oh, the whole world. Mm. So then I go, ah, just attack. The best, the best offense, yeah. uh, your best defense is a good yeah. offense. And you're allowing yourself not to be a victim anymore. Like, yeah. You're not going to leave these people. That's it. I'll refuse yeah. to be a victim. And my thing's even like, like I, I've said, you know, me and my cousins and all that, and we've evolved a match, hitting whatever, 
bigger in the fights and even like but even just brawls like brawls you know like I did a brawl one time at a wedding and a cousin of mine was getting attacked by these fellas who were bowel fiends and whatever we grabbed them we were outnumbered it was only me and my cousin and, uh, and my brother Joe and so we grabbed them and just brought them out to the front but then they came out and there was like 20 of them and there was no running mm. and my cousin fainted on the ground because he was wake as water after being pulled and dragged and I just turned to the boys and said, we just have to stand now, that's it. Yeah. And I said, whatever happens, happens. That's it. You have to, just, happens, you just use the psychotic part. So I went over to one of them and uh, got him a nice lucky punch, knocked him out straight away. And then I had five, six, seven fellas on me at one time. They did it to me, other two, my brother and my cousin as well, and both of them got put in the ground and smashed up. Uh, but my brother Joe gave a really good go, especially like, but they couldn't take me down. Do you remember Jake Lamont? He can't take me down. <laughs> like, I just refused to go down. I said, boys, there's nothing that's going to get me down. And they're roaring at me and they're Budweiser bottles in my head and all this stuff. And they wouldn't get me down. And I, I, when I mean I put power, I mean I, I would ever punch from the ground. Mm. That's the shots I was giving these veins. And I was like, I was hurting. Like two or three of them went on the ambulance very badly hurt. Just a rage that comes mm. over you and you can't feel pain. Mm. It's like the whole thing. Black. Yeah, you black. can't. Uh, you can't feel pain. Yeah, and then back in the hotel room later on that night, oh, wake is water. Do you know black what? guys, everything. <laughs> Can you pay an head? Would somebody give me an aspirin, lads? Do you, do you know for people that are listening to this, yeah, they wouldn't understand what we're. Even, mm. Do you know they wouldn't understand it? You you really have to grow up in in a really tough environment mm. to be able to understand that when enough of bad things happen to you. You hit a spot in life where you have to make a decision for yourself mm. that it's never going to happen again. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on, nobody will ever hurt you in that physical yeah. or mental way again. And that's what happens. It's built, remember we were saying that's built into you? Yeah. You can be aware about it, but it's always there. And you said that if someone harmed one of your family in the morning, like that's there yeah. and it's there to protect them. And it's just to kind of give it into a little bit of context to people no. that don't understand it. It's not that I am a bad person, no. you're a bad person or anybody else that wants to. It's just in, in, in the areas we grew up in, that's how we had to mind ourselves. We were never bad people. It was just things happened and we had to do these things to be able to survive in the communities mm. that we grew up in. Well, it's, a, it it's a sad, mad and bad thing. That's it. There's very rarely a bad person. No. They're usually sad or they're mad. Or they're hurt. Even. You know what I mean? And that was me. And yeah. it still is me. And that's why that's that code will always will never be broken. You harm anybody belonging to me, I'm willing to do life in jail. Outside of that, I can keep it calm. I mediate, I, I go from family to family and stop them arguing. I do that now today. Me, me and my brothers do that. We're kind of the go-to where we're from. Does that work, John? Maybe so, a mediation between... So, like, we've often had it even with groups of cousins, right, who are both fucking the same to us, you know? So what would happen is my brother Joe would go to one of them and it's just, you have to go and listen, listen to all the stuff. Mm -hmm. You have to... Never report any of the bad stuff. Mm. You have to play a blinder, basically. And you have to, you have to kind of hint that the other side one piece, but you can't say it out direct because it'll, it'll become a slagging thing. Yeah. Then. And then I go to the other and I'm doing the same thing. And they're telling you, I want to kill them and I'm going to, and they're getting this and I'm getting a shot and I got it all. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, 100%. But listen, I know you don't want the trouble. Like, boys, said, listen, we let it go. I'm like, I'm never letting it go. And you know, you have to do that for the whole day. Mm. The whole day. Because there's always one hot head in the family. And then oftentimes even you get the deal and then one hand out and then they go into it. And that happened before actually when I was doing a mediating between two two different groups. Me and my brother, Joe, and uh, we had the deal. Finally after about seven, eight hours of going back and forth. And we're sick of our bollocks at this time. like. And then the two blackguards on each side rode each other. So I said, right, get the fuck in that car now. And the two of them are cowards. I said, get the fuck in that car now. I said, you're going to fight now. As a year to one starting all this. So we got them in the car and the two, the two of them went at each other. The worst boxers I've ever seen in my life. But it was a great fight because they didn't know how to fight. Yeah, yeah. So when one would hit, the other one would go to the ground. I was like, this is a great fight. <laughs> and the referee with me, the fair play man said to me, he said, John, uh, listen, call a draw now because the first, it was the first thing you do is ask for a draw because the best way is always a draw. Mm -hmm. But I said, no, 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 no. There's no draws. I said, these have to punch each other's faces in and then I'll ask for a draw. Do you know what I mean? So I let them matter for about six, seven minutes. Now, six, seven minutes when you're not a boxer sure. and you're and, it's, and there's four swinging knockdowns swinging from helicopters and windmills, <laughs> right? <laughs> then I went in, and then I went in when they're awake as well. Then I went in. I said, boys, 
Then you like a draw. Yeah, yeah straight away they killed him. <laughs> As we stop your black garden. They were gassed yeah. over the desk there. Yeah, well. just, that was it. Yeah, I seen uh, tagged on the Twitter a good few years ago. Now at this stage, I'd say there was a feud. It could have been one in Northside of Cork, or it could have been somewhere else. And this guy tagged you, and he says. John, uh, you should get John in. They they want to listen to settled people, and your response was funny. Well, and he says, "I tell you what," he says, "seeing as you're a settled man, why don't you go in the media between the the Kinnahins and the Hutches all together? <laughs> it's just because I'm a traveller, right? Yeah. Supposed to go in and yeah. fix that. Why don't you fix that?" And John is not better to do either, by the way. Like John hasn't got his own old career going. Or, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> whatever. It's gastic. I remember one thing. <laughs> you do get fucking actually. I'm gonna tell a story. My friend Teddy's there. Their yeah, boys is a funny one, right? So this theme was talking me on Facebook. Big fan, love hate fan, Harbour Gangs fan, all that. And he's talking me. And I ain't trying to be nice to fans, always right, yeah, genuinely. Unless we are the trolling, yeah. He, no, he's talking me in a good way, like he yeah. was a bit, just a bit weird, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, like unless a fiend is an ignorant to me, I'll give them all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and anybody. There was one thing actually. One time uh, said to me, uh, rugby, rugby top. He was wearing. So that'll tell you where he's from. Yeah. I'm getting a selfie with you. And I said, sorry, you want to remember that head and Lily's. Lily Bordellos, oh, I'm getting a selfie with you. I said, you're getting, you're getting, you mean you want the selfie? Uh, no, I, I'm getting a selfie with you. Entitled, like. I said, I'll tell you what you're getting. I said, I'm going to take your shoulder from your chest if you don't go out that door now. Oh my God. So that's the kind of thing, that's the only yeah. thing I turned down a selfie in my whole life. <laughs> yeah, but the stalker fan, right? He was on to me. He's a big fan. My son's a big fan, all this, blah, blah. I said, oh, nice one, mate. Yeah, blah. I'd love to meet you. Like, I'd love to. Come on, like, I can't meet every fucking fan that I've got there. I said, where do you live? I said, nah, 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 none of that. Could you send me your address? Remember, Daddy? Right, so I said, listen, I'm drawing a line up to this. <laughs> you, you're, you're not getting me a address, right? I'm not going to fucking meet you. You're unless him up in the uh, unless, unless I happen to fucking meet you, right? And me and Teddy is in my uh, my little house in Darndale, right? My mother's house in Darndale. And we're on the we're on the couches together. And we're just smoking rollies, drinking tea, saying this famous gas, right? So anyway, the next night then, I looks at, I just signs into me, inst- me fucking me, me messenger, and there's a million and one texts of him, right? He obviously had to get gargled and got a bit of pluck and start getting bowled, you know? And it was just slayed me, right? And the funniest one ever, remember I said, he said the funniest one ever, he said, John, if it wasn't for Love Hedge, you'd still be fighting in car parks. <laughs> I said to Teddy, Teddy, read that. I swear. But what happened then was, I got back to him and I said, 100%, right? <laughs> so then he went, no, that wasn't me. You know, he was a guy, he got afraid then, like, or he was sorry, because uh, obviously he was drunk, like. So you, you meet random words like that. You have to laugh at insults. We, uh, I, lo- I love laughing against that. Like. Twitter the last time, I was laughing, no. But there, were, there was a, an inspirational, there was a picture of Timmy and there was an inspirational quote, you know, and it was like, well done, love the tonaries, then you might come to the two gormies. I think sometimes it says, well done, the two gormies. Boys, but, but Twitter is the, Twitter is a hell of a so bad, I, I don't expect anything positive to happen know, on Twitter. I know. Yeah. Instagram is a different story. It is. Though. It's different and it's negative in another way because it's kind of more na- narcissistic, whereas Twitter is sure negative. But, but I mean, I just drop in and out of it, so it suits me. How you want but, Twitter now? No, I, I like uh, that Roderick O'Gorman yeah, whole see. fiasco. I said, Twitter will never see me ever again, yeah, yeah. ever again. Uh, I got out of it, and yeah, I'm never going to go back on Twitter. It'll never ever see me again. Yeah. I'm happy enough on Instagram. Yeah, but the yeah. office is more, more, and, and that's that's a good decision. It's a bit of a crack, it's a bit of crack at it as well. Like, yeah. in the gas, it's back gas, but because he's go me, fiend, yours, and all yeah. that. You know, that's traveler language. I know that, yeah. it's mad yeah. the way Cork and Limerick does that. Yeah. I find yeah. that fascinating. We grew movie. up at that time, I know, yeah. but gee, to me, would be like travelers. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's where that's the talk we grew up in, yeah, yeah. The Spring Lane is in Blackpool. I know Spring Lane, so yeah. There's loads, and then yeah. there's travellers living in houses all yeah. over. So the language just gets into gas, isn't it? People yeah. say, yeah. like, oh, that's uh, Limerick slang, Cork slang. It's not Cork yeah. slang at all. It's yeah. actually traveller. Yeah, yeah. Gammon, exactly. In yeah, it's language, gas. You know? But, like, when I go down to places like Cork and Limerick, and you like, working class place in Cork and Limerick, I couldn't tell the difference between the traveller and the settler person. Yeah. I can't. Yeah. Because, you know, like, people don't even understand there's so many different branches of travellers. Yeah. Like every family is different. Yeah. Every family has a different accent. But the gas, there's, there's some settled people then trying to be travellers. Yeah, know, oh, does that? That's a big thing now. Hat, yeah, that, that's you know? the big thing. Yeah. But where, where I'm from, like uh, in uh, in Kulak, there was so there's the wards, which is basically my people, my mother's people, and uh, you have McDonough's, you have Collins's, um, you have Mongans, Martins, uh, you have Purcells, um, 
uh, Joyce's everybody's a different accent like mm. every family is a different accent within a mile radius of each other people yeah. wouldn't understand that like yeah. it's mad like it's like the Collins would be where I where I grew up and I grew up with Collins would be almost they actually would be far out with like all travelers are incest the best sex and all that but uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> they would be very close we grew up in the box clubs together lovely people but their accent would be very different to mine and we live next door to each other do you ever visit TVG in Cork? Pablo Visibility Group so No Pablo Project in Blackpool I could have I've done a lot of things Like that down in Cork yeah. I never remember yeah. An organisation yeah. yeah. Big organisation yeah. yeah. Family yeah. Up in the wild yeah. right? And there's these Three or four women mm. And there's All the clans In the north side yeah. All the clans in Cork City Are from these Two or three women you know? yeah. Oh yeah. yeah McCarthy's Jesus yeah. The McCarthy's yeah. Yeah. Well I have more McCarthy In me than anything else Because my grandmother Was McCarthy both sides yeah. And then my grandfather Her husband Was half McCarthy yeah. So, and like, yeah, more McCarthy than anything else. Do you know when you're growing up in uh, in Downdale, what's the relationship be, like between the settled community and the travelling community? It's that, so say I grew up in Kulak, if for some reason it was worse than Bell Camp, which is right next to Darndale, which is in Kulak, we had a, but good, it was good as well, like, you know, but in Darndale, very little discrimination, if I'm being honest. Yeah. Very little. Because you have to remember the, the most little it can be, basically, yeah. you know? Um, but you have to remember they're stigmatised themselves yeah. Yeah. and they're like Kulak is stigmatised now Darndale is an area is a council say within Kulak that Kulak people don't even want to be associated with that it's, different level it's like the worst address you could probably have in Dublin is Darndale like, yeah. like I mean the worst to get a job it is that isn't it like so the Darndale aliens that's what the Darndalian aliens that's what they're called you know what I mean that's what I am one of them myself like okay. But well, so I'm a Darndale, Darndale traveller, never had a shot. But, uh, <laughs> but the, so the, we, we fucking, Darndale had such a great community. And like my boxer trainer lived in Darndale, that's where he lived as well. Like he was a community leader. And we just got along grand. Like I'd, I'll settle friends, and, you know, of course, all the bureaus are settled in Darndale, and, you know, we're, which was handy. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, like we have very little discrimination there. You're stigmatized because, and discriminated against because of the, your address. Mm. They're putting on a CV for applications. Mm. So Downdale, but then coming from the site within Downdale is another mm. added discrimination. Absolutely. But yeah. you know, when you're growing up, do you feel like that your prospects in life are not there for you? Oh, yeah. Oh, man, so listen, I don't even know how, like I know how it all happened for me. Not that I'm in a Hollywood or anything like that, but where to where I am, like it's it's bad thing to say, like my mother would have encouraged us so much, but I know she would have been happy enough that we just grow up, we're not criminals and we're not addicted to drugs. Yeah. Like, that is amazing. Yeah. That's, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But she'd encourage anything beyond that and yeah. would believe in you. Yeah, that's a bonus. Like, yeah. yeah. So, like, I'm looking now and go, like, I still go, what's, what's going on? Like, well, how did life get me here? How am I making films? How am I... Like, how, I just, did, how did films start? How yeah. did it all come together? Yeah. Uh, fucking did, a, did an acting class. Yeah. Just serendipity, boys, to be honest. Like, uh, there's a plan out there for all of us. And I think if you tune into that frequency, you'll 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 see the plan. Fine, That's man. basically it. And uh my brother Joe, when I decided to kill myself, my brother Joe knocked on my door yeah. and said, Are you gonna kill yourself? What's that? And I says, No, but I gave him an indication I was because I didn't want to say it, but I wanted to talk about it because I was desperate, because I was in pain and all that. And he says, he said to me, please don't because we can't afford to bury you. <laughs> was he so, serious, John? He was serious as well and joking. Oh, yeah. He genuinely, because the shame yeah. of not being able to bury my old brother, that's actually a serious thing. But he made it into, he masqueraded into a nice joke. And he said, look, man, you need to do something. You need to find something else. Like, uh, you, what age were you, John? I was 20, 20. I wonder, did he have any uh, was, what was training it? around suicide awareness? Oh, he no. the right question. Yeah. Just, I mean, it's ask, it's like, the number one question to ask them. Are you yeah. going to do it? Have yeah. you plan? Yeah, because because it, it erupts in front of you. One yeah. way or another, you'll find out. You can gauge from their body language yeah. at minimum, which is what he did. My brother Joe has just been always very, very intelligent and in tune. He's a character as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 Just yeah. me two brothers, to be honest with you, we were all... Genetically blessed, yeah. and my mother says it's me, now to be daddy. Like she'd always say, well, "None of my business." They got the brains and their daddy, and we had we. And also, lads, when you grow up around danger, you're always looking for danger. Yeah, your your senses get very sharp. It's problem solving, isn't it? You see a problem, you're trying to fix it, and you don't even know you're trying to do it as a kid. But it, later in life, yeah. they become your sharp fucking tools. Yeah. And now we can see them coming a mile away now. Like, um, but he said that to me, and then he said, "Look, Joe, John, you know, boxing." Didn't work out. You didn't want to go back. Blah blah blah. You're at the game all this way. 
why did you try acting? Now, he didn't just say that and pull that out of his arse. It's because I uh, was obsessed with films as a child. Like, and like the previous two years, I just spent watching films after I gave up what I was doing, the nasty stuff. And all I did was only left the house to go to collect me doll, buy DVDs or go to the cinema. That was it. So he said, why did you try acting? And I, I, I just saw a life jacket. That was it. And I said, yeah. And rang up an acting class and... Uh, the bureau said to me on the other end of the phone, Kathleen Warner Yates, great acting teacher, mentor as well, from America. She said, uh, "Why well, enjoy acting for fun, uh, this course we have. And I knew that, that's wrong for me, as I need something more intense. She said, there's a scene study course, and uh, you're going to be uh, out of your depth in it, like, really. So maybe that's not the best. I said, I'll do that. And uh, <laughs> I said, how much is it? 290 euro. They get 100 euro in my dole. Got the rest of my brother Joe from his dole. And um, got the re- and then my mother, I got five quid for the bus in and out of town. And I uh, went into the class and was uh, intimidated straight away and decided to leave the class. But an improvisation happened. And uh, that kind of, I was just kind of curious watching it unfold. Like, and this Brazilian man, uh, this black Brazilian man was in a scene with like an upper class Dublin fella. And the upper class Dublin fella dictated the scene. And that's the way it was set up. So he became the, the, the customer who was going to buy off the shopkeeper and it could be any kind of variation of that. Yeah. So he went in and he decided like it was a health food store and he was looking for vanilla protein and whatever, you know. And uh, But he ended up re- being really patronising towards a Brazilian man. like, <clears throat> And um, I thought it was racist, to be honest. He was making a laugh of his kind of accent and language. and So I just felt a bit of solidarity with yeah. the Brazilian man and I got enraged and depression and anger. is like Sammy Swin. So I... Uh, I st- I volunteered because the Dublin fella then became the shopkeeper and they were looking for a new customer to dictate the scene. So I walked out of the class and uh, it's because I'm getting nervous now because I remember being so nervous. Um, but what happened was I I knew I was I could belt now and, and they'd never get me. And I'd walk away and I'd be really comfortable. But I was so fucking angry that I ran, I busted through that door and I basically imagined there was a bank and I went in and robbed the bank and robbed him and I slapped the face of him and I took the shirts off him and his shoes and socks and, and the teacher ran in and roared like, John, stop, please stop. <laughs> I got up the living Jesus. So I ran out of class and she ran after me like, and I ran the whole way down Abbey Street and she was like, please come back. I said, please don't ring the shades. And she was like, please stop, John, stop. Like, and I went, okay, I said, what is it? She said, don't ever fucking do that again. And I said, okay. I said, but I like that. That was good. I said, oh shit. There's potential there. Yeah. Fine. yeah. Small, but like- she said, let's see what else you can do. You can do raids like I've never seen. <laughs> let's see if you can do the other stuff. So she gave me like a, a vulnerable character to play about 10 weeks later on a play, on a thing. But I had the lines learned from it 12 hours later by not to go. I never slept. And I just learned the lines for this 10, min- 10 minute scene, which yeah. normally take you two weeks to learn. I learned it. I just, le- I just learned it over and over the whole night. Googling on the internet and all, all the tips and all the shit. And uh, come back the next week, no, knew me lines inside out, most prepared man in the class. And then I was like, okay, here's a new obsession. And then the universe, the universe took over then mm. because, I mean, my goal was, I was like 20 that time. I said, if, if, I, got, if I got an old short film to act in by the time I was 25 or something, you know, that'd be great. Like, uh, within six months, I got the lead in a feature film. What was the name of that again? King of the Travellers. King of the Travellers, I've seen that, John. So my, my childhood buddy, John Collins, uh, who's still a good friend of mine, and all his family, love all that family, he was the lead in the film originally, and then I got a, I rehearsed for it and got a bit of a small part, and then uh, I was rehearsing for months, because we were all like kind of non-actors, so we were rehearsing for months like a play, like, and um, they ended up sacking him, and he turned around and said, I better, you better be giving it to John Connors. And he went, yeah, actually we are. So fair play to old John. Mm. And he could think of it to me. And I was like, the lead role in a fucking million euro budget film, it was like mad. Yeah. Just mad. Like, you're going, what the fuck? And uh, I had no right being the lead in it, to be honest. Like, looking back in that, like, I learned a lot, but it's like, I couldn't watch that film. Like, What's the Travellers at White House? 
Was it what's the problem? Morehouse. 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 Yeah. The Morehouses and the Powers. Is, right. And listen, it ended up causing a bit of feud between the Morehouse and the Powers in Wicklow or something. <laughs> they ended up killing each other. <laughs> you dirty boss, you Morehouse, you boss. Yeah. Of course, I got life imitating <laughs> art and art imitating life and all that. Know, yeah. um, and then I was on set with that, and me and Mark O'Connor, the director that uh, talked about, I was talking about a play I was writing about my father mm-hmm. and about schizophrenia and mental health. And then he knew a fellow who was a stalker and blah, blah, blah. A fellow who was a kind of a, f- a cinema buff stalker that he knew in Ranelagh in a place in Dublin. And we combined both stories and made a film called The Stalker, which did brilliant critically. And actually went to the same festival that year as King of the Travellers and won an award ahead of King of the Travellers and it was only a 15 grand budget compared to what I You know, it's kind of a mad, crazy film. And then Love, Hate and... That was, so you, you got a huge, you got a big role in you know, something that was like an Irish cultural phenomenon. At yeah. Love, Hate. Yeah. How did it come about? What was it like being cast into that... Like the, that fame. Well, it's weird because I did Love Hate before King of the Travellers ended them because <clears throat> the cast and director came to Darnell Box Club and said, We're looking for tough looking fellas uh, to be uh, extras. And uh, Jerry, me trainer, actually said, Oh, John is there. Uh, John's doing acting. He does the old classes and all that. John, come over here. And I says, uh, I said, nah, I know it's just being an extra. Like They said, well, look, there's a couple of special extra roles and there's a few lines. Can't guarantee them, but if you show up in the day, fight for them. You know what I mean? I said, okay, no problem. So I showed up and um, it was the pipe bombing thing where Nids is buying a pipe bomb off me, but I, I didn't know if I was getting that character or whatever. I was going to be standing around. But it was me and this fellow, i never forget a fellow, a red-haired fellow from Kilmore in Dublin, two of us together. And Caffo, the director of Love Hate, who's now went on to be a huge director, uh, he came over to start. Well, lads, how are you doing? How are you doing? What's up? What tell me? And I was like, ah, oh, blah blah. Born in London. London, yeah, I'm living in London thirty years and blah blah. And I said, whereabouts? Oh, the Caledonia Road. I said, I lived there. I, he said, it was a pub there. I said, yeah, my father was a drink there. I used to drink with travellers there. I probably drank with your father. What year? I said, 89, 90. Other. Yeah. And I was like, connecting. He said, do you want these lines? And I went straight away, yeah, I want these lines. But what I didn't know was, uh, I kind of had, I didn't really know the the efficacy around it all and the way you behave. Because I looked at the lines and I went, yeah, they're, they're mine. They're not. And I don't want to, because the writer and me are good friends. But, but these particular lines didn't work for me. You needed your own. Yeah. Words. I said, look, I'm from the hood. I'm from the Iron Traveller. I know this world inside out. He's not going to say that. And the director said, oh, well, what would he say then? I said, blah, 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 blah. And whatever I said, whatever it is, put a pop on or whatever, that was part of it. Um, what happened was I did the scene with, with Nidge and uh, and I did King of Travellers talking then and at, at, after the premiere of one of them in Galway, Stuart Carlin, the writer, come up to me and he said, he said, John, I'm the writer of Love Hate. And I went, yeah. He said, you know, he said, he said, uh, you improvise some lines on the set. He said, playing that pipe bomb uh, character, the special extra character. I said, yeah. He said, you haunted my dreams, you bastards. Yeah, he said, because the improv was so good. Mm. And I went, okay. He said, would you like to come back? Let's find a way of making it back. Now, it appears so obvious now. Obviously, I gave the bomb to Nades that blew up Linda's house. In France. But like when the plot is not there, you don't know. So he didn't know what way to bring me back. And then he just decided, okay. You created it all around you, saw it. Yeah, created it all around me for season four. And uh, it was in three episodes and I was fucking over the moon. Mm-hmm. Over the moon. And then in season five, my character left, went to England. And then I met him and he just said, look, Tom, your character is no real hinterland or whatever. We just showed your character. Do you want to come back? And if so, do you want to do a small or big? I said, what do you fucking think? Mm. All the way, is it? So he worked with me for about six weeks and we, me and him just became really good friends. But mm. sound cunt and did his due diligence and did it right. Mm. And, uh, and then the result is some of the best writing I was ever confronted with. You know? What was it like becoming so famous? With the draft time? Was it a big adjustment? Or did not think about it too much? Or? No, it was weird. Was it? Weird. Like, you have to understand as well, man, like I grew up getting a lot of hate mm-hmm. and then a lot of fucking discrimination and then all of a sudden all these guns are over and they're, and they're wanting this and that and you go and then I'm like I have the chip on my shoulder who you fuck you where are you coming where, where are you, where are you yeah. then you know what I mean like and then you're still treating my people like this but you come over to me and alright because I'm a famous traveller and it was all that shite which was me yeah. do you know what I mean like I should have just went smile do a, have a smile like Coke and shut the fuck up yeah. you know what I mean but uh, you don't know that you have to learn it yourself yeah. and if someone tells you that it doesn't work anyway you yeah. have to go through the process but how would, the weird one was I went to the UB40 concert I love UB40 yeah, me too. and uh, went to them in the Olympia and uh, goes to the side side entrance and there's a security guard there was an old boxer man of mine Michael Parker great boxer southpaw and he said Sean oh, what's up man and the night before I think it was or the week before 
the episode with me saying, take it back with you and use it to buy yourself a headstone. When it when it became one of the first kind of memes in Irish social media and it went viral, you know. And uh, so I didn't really realise because I was only walking around my own area for a week down there and everybody says, ah, Jono, whatever. So I was in the town for the first time then, since then. And he said, Jono, bad idea. He clocked us right away. He said, he said, don't don't walk through there. Like, I said, what? What are you talking about? He says, you're going to be a mob man. I said, Quay, man, I'm going to be a fucking mob. What are you talking about? <laughs> we have 500 people. <laughs> we have 500 people between him and the door. And I got mobbed. And when I got mobbed, when I'm in mobbed, right, I got harassed. And my T-shirt was ripped off me. Oh, God. Women ripping my T-shirt off, scraping me like it was a fucking beetle. And to stay to me, I'm no oil paint. Like, women, now, and this one's not even a joke, lads. It's just getting dark. Uh, women grabbed me by the balls. Fuck off. Sexually assault me, man. <laughs> and you loved it. <laughs> yeah, maybe I did. <laughs> but I like some of them, maybe. Um, but so anyway, the security have to come out. And the security have to get all around me to bring me to my seat. So they bring me to the seat, but then they get mobbed in my seat. Okay. And he said, oh, Jesus, you're a distraction. To the... So then we have to give you a VIP. Brought me down to VIP. I got mobbed in VIP, but that was right in front of the trades. And Ali Campbell literally was going like that. They get, do something with me. Uh, because I was such a, because it was right in front of the stage of the VIP. So he would, they were the performers on the stage were fucking distracted. So they had to put me into a boot. And I was like, what the fuck is this? Uh, it was crazy. And not good at oh, all. Man. Not good at all. How did you feel, John? Oh, overwhelmed, man. Yeah. Overwhelmed, like. Now, then that night I went out, I went straight to a nightclub and I got straight in the door, which was a refreshing feeling. Because yeah. every nightclub I ever, I probably got refused from every nightclub I've ever got, went to before that in town. Yeah. Like, every, I remember me, me, bro, me uncle, a ironically named brother, who's one of my best old friends as well, and the funniest man you ever met in your life. Your uncle, his name is... Brother. <laughs> yeah, don't, we don't want him to get it, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, his name is brother. But uh, it's because he was the first brother to come along in the family, like 20 year line. You oh, know? Uh, so, so, yeah. So me and him went, and we counted, we counted, we went to 35 pubs and clubs and got turned down by all of them in one night. Like, this is before it was famous. <laughs> And then two, three months later, then I can get into the nightclub and, yeah. uh, in town. And then you're going, I'm annoyed by that as well, like. Uh, yeah. Then they give you the VIP and the free fucking champers. Yeah. <laughs> and you then you like, have that, <laughs> that status and that fame. Can get it's terrible, isn't it? Input. But everything is status. Like, if you look at, if you think back in fucking caveman times, it was all status. Women didn't want the little weakling in the corner, the little beta male who was collecting <laughs> leaves. Nah. They wanted the fucking Adonis over there who was killing animals. I know. It's, it's all status. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I do hate when people. Um, treat people different over status. Mm. That I think is fucking horrible. You know, it's ho I think that's horrible. Like mm. to do it now. It happens with in between genders in a different way. But I mean, when people do that in general, like they give this fella the time of day because he has X, Y, and Z, but not this. And I see it a lot with with travellers along with money and that. You know what I mean? I think it's a horrible denigrating thing to do to people. Like, um, I think just treat people fucking as they fucking yeah. come. Like, you know what I mean? I think it's the only way. Yeah, and nothing that doesn't matter whether they're sitting in the streets. Yeah. Inside in the hospital, you know, up inside in the prison or whatever it may be, it's you have to, if you treat people with respect, yeah. it changes their perspe perception of, of, of the reality of life. I was well. only over in Richmond in England, which is in London, which is like the poshest part of London, Richmond. It's beside Twickenham. And I was in a, a hotel that was like a thousand sterling a night overlooking the Thames. I didn't pay for it. It was a company I was working for and doing a big TV show for Netflix. Can't say what it is though, but a big gangster show for Netflix Global. And I was down and I was having an old fag on the bench overlooking the Thames, a lovely old view. And an old fiend came down and he was mildly drunk and rough, rough fiend now, a rough looking old fiend. And when he was walking down, it was like Moses parting the fucking sea. All the people were just running for this thing. And when he came just even near the benches, they all read off the benches. And I just seen it happening like in real time. And I just felt overwhelmingly fucking emotional for this thing. You know, you go, imagine everywhere you go, people are just running away from you like, mm -hmm. like he's a pariah. And he said to me, all right, mate, have you got a smoke? And I went, 100%, I said, sit down there. And uh, I gave him fucking a packet of fags. I had three packets of fags. I gave him a packet of fags and I gave him a lighter. And uh, I said, tell me your story, man. Oh, actually, my grandfather was Irish and he was in the IRA and all. I said, no way, man. Are you serious? <laughs> and we're going up the rash yet and whatever, you know. These fucking cunts, they don't fucking know. You know what I mean? He's playing, he's playing me as well, but I get it. You know what I mean? 
And then I he says, the fags. Yeah, you know, like, <laughs> <"Bags, laughs> <I love fags." laughs> what do you say? He offers me, he offers me a, a Suffy's wine. I said, nah, I won't bother, man. I won't have him. But I had about an hour long conversation. I've had the best crack of him of all time. Like, yeah. and I gave him an old tenor and all his way. And there's, there's just a lovely fucking interaction. Isn't it lovely? Humanity, there was total yeah. humanity. And he got into his trauma. I wouldn't even go into all that stuff, but he had a yeah. terrible old trauma. Like, you, yeah. What's happening in your life to lead you today? Man, sure. Just, he's just the result of all his experiences. That's all it fucking is. And you know what? The, the result of them experiences are just still down here. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's where the and he is, repressed. Is, he repressed it all. Still he can't there. express it. No. So is he's it, expressing the truth. He's expressing the truth. Fucking true self-destructive behavior. Yeah. That's fucking what it is. I've done it myself a million fucking times. Press that button. It's about time now. Yeah. Like I do it every ten years. Every ten years I do the, the self-destruction thing probably. But do you think this? Do you know all those people that were sitting on those benches um, that ran away from him? Do you think if he was able to stand up in front of all those people and give his story of where he came from, that they'd have that little bit of compassion and empathy for him and they'd, they'd probably sit but there. But it does the bridge of how he gets there, as in, if they're going to sit to yes, listen. That is, that it is about the bridge. I think most people and, would because most people are not psychopaths. And, and that's and that's what and that's what we're doing here. This is what this platform is about. That's what it's about. This is what it is. It's, it's about getting the, those stories out there. And this is why I love this platform, and I think you two are the, some of the most important people in this space, that's genuinely, uh, and you're the most unique for this kind of platform. And what I love about year bringing this thing all around, what bringing it back around to what we're saying, ye don't go for status. Mm. Your guests are not about status oh. at all. That is, ye, that is your fucking selling point, is that you're fucking authentic. Mm. And see, authenticity is one thing I've learned in life. If you're fucking authentic, shit happens for you. If you can remain authentic and keep your fucking morals and and, and live by your code, good things fucking happen. Authenticity, authenticity breeds. We can smell it off people. And that's what that's why you've been successful at. Yeah. You're totally authentic. Yeah, but I think it helps that we've no media background yeah. or training or anything like that. So that would ruin it. Yeah. yeah. Training. You'd, you'd yeah. have these like bullet point questions and all. Yeah. Like, It'd be fucking sleepy. <laughs> well, I'd, over there I'd, say, over. I'd say, please kill me. Like. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, but instead you're able to tease things out of people lads and you feel comfortable and I've watched a lot of your episodes right and I can I just know right because I've went through it all myself and I've went through things like I've been a support worker even for five years and did lots of workshops and whatever and I know how fucking smart you are and how you you can sit back listen be relaxed create an atmosphere you don't jump on the guest you live things relax and then people open up and it's why you've blown up yeah. it's because people open up and then we get a we get a look into their soul, yeah. and that's fucking gold. And it's because you're so fucking emotionally mature, mm. you've went to hell and back, mm. and you come out the fucking other side. Like that's fucking beautiful, lads. You lose your ego when you're yeah. Like. It, but it, do you have you know that's interesting actually because we haven't wanting true addiction and everything and into recovery and whatever. This coming along and your kind of, your stars now, lads, and especially in Cork, has has the ego sneaked up a bit? Has the ego sneaked up a bit though? No. Yeah. Oh, even when somebody yeah. says something like that, I feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's my stuff. Yeah. Do you know, it's just that I still go to work and I work with my hands. Yeah. Do you know, I go home at the end of the day. I, 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 I do whatever my wife needs me to do. Yeah. I do the podcast. I fucking do my invoices. I answer my emails. I do our talks we have to do. I don't look as as myself being any different to who I was before any better how, any how, when did you set this up two three years ago three years tomorrow this month 2020 so and, June 20, and how long are both you in recovery I'm tw 12 years 12 years It'll be 10 years next month 12 years 10 years so what if nine years ago could you have done this absolutely not no. why because I wasn't it, it takes yeah. a lot of personal development yeah. and self acceptance to stand on camera and not try to be something that you aren't Stop yeah. accepting yourself. You don't have to try and be tough. Uh, yeah. You don't have to be trying to be this. Yeah. You are who you are. Uh, accept yourself. Just and draw when you get to that space, then you can be authentic. Fuck. And you can yeah. leave yourself vulnerable. And so what if you get emotional? And so what if you're afraid sometimes? Everybody else is. They just mask it. But you just have a little bit of self-acceptance. True years of therapy. That's ongoing as well. We never got a certificate to say, go on about your business, you're recovered. <laughs> it's an ongoing thing. And you know, we've had difficult times, myself and Timmy, in the last three years, personal lives and stuff like that. But like, this is a passion. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, fuck's sake, I have to do a podcast. It's like, yes, who's the podcast? What's the topic? What's the guest? Then when we go into the prisons and stuff yeah. like that, and 
we met a fella, I give this story, we met a fella in Weefield there uh, last month, and he was in the basement in Mount Joy, and he was uh, self-harming, he was after, the, I won't give too much details, but yeah. he badly self-harming in a bad way, and he's linked him with a lot of services, right, and uh, nothing was working for him, and he started to, to play the podcast at Mount Joy, and uh, in the padded cell, he started, he started, started it. watching it, mm. and he was identified with me, Timmy, and some of the stories of the guests, and uh, things started, you know, he started to identify and see, like, fucking maybe I'm not fucking mad. Look, I can identify with him, and he's doing he. I know he's in another prison now, out of the basement. He's not self harming. Mm. He's engaged with psychology, going to the school. And when we met him, he was so thankful for the podcast. Jesus. It just gave him a little bit of hope that turned him around, you know what I mean? So, like. That's real evidence of, of doing good, man. You don't give a shit about rewards or no. money or you know, ratings or anything like that. That's real people's yeah. lives that's been helped. Wait, conversations like this. Do you know this this table, these few mics here, the few cameras, this is why I do it. I do it for no other reason. I often say to him, like, I just want to be doing the podcast. That's it. I love doing the podcast. We have to do other stuff to be able to keep everything, keep going. Yeah. Like that. Of and, and it's good, like, listen, it's good to be able to give back as well and, and do whatever you can, but it's just what I get from this on a personal level to be sitting across here now and you opening your soul to me and, and the other few guests that we had here today, it's the most powerful thing for someone to give you that bit of trust and to be able to share their experience with you. Yeah. It, yeah. You don't, you can't get it anywhere else. Yeah. And I can see here straight away sitting across from whoever's here and it never happens and I'm going to be very honest. We never have a guest here that's here for the wrong reasons. Like no. Never. Everybody's no, vested. Never. No. Yeah, of course. If, um, if it's not, they're not genuine and authentic, people course. are just going to say, the boys yeah. have to sell because, them out. Yeah, exactly. Because when you feel it, you see it, I, 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 you lose, you, you're lost. I can't, I, I can't, because I can't feel you then. You yeah. know, and it's, it's beautiful, it's beautiful to be able to listen to someone's story, listen to your story yeah. there, John, like the emotion, and I can mm. relate to a lot of stuff, and sometimes sure. when I'm kind of emotional, I keep, I stay a bit quiet. Yeah. Because... I know it's just it's the way I am. You're affected by it. Yeah, you have to feel it, like because I can. F I I I understand. I understand your upbringing. Of course, of course. Kind of Similar of background, yeah. Traveller. Yeah, but I come from a background. But as I said, I can't do the difference between you anyway. Yeah. To have a thing. <laughs> the gold me feeling and all the door. I go what? It's not like, It's it's an amazing thing to be a, some yeah. a part of. Like it's it's, yeah. it's it's absolutely amazing. The last time we spoke, you were a funny Mount Joy story. Oh yeah, which one did I tell? Actually, was about the about the fame. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you want to tell us that? I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I <laughs> so I, I go in and visit the prisons, and I, first of all, these for ask me to go and do chats and all that. Right? That's boring the shit out of people. But I, I went in to do a chat one day, and um, I, I, I felt the room, and I felt they were all interested in acting so much, like they wanted to actually act. And I just went to the bureau, the psychotherapist. I said, like, can I just do a fucking workshop with them? Like, and she says, yeah, go on ahead. So I got them all around, and my my old mate Clinchy, who's who died last year, last May, right? Yeah, so, May rest in peace. Uh, it's he's one year anniversary now. This month, uh, uh, he was an old legend. Um, but anyway, he was in the he was in the room when we were doing the workshop, and uh, he's a great actor. And I said it in his funeral, Clinchy never acted a day in his life. He was totally authentic. You know what I mean? Like he didn't act. Um, but uh, he was there, and he was he was giving me the sister the room and whatever, and start doing things and I put him in a scene with another fan who I didn't know I didn't know who he was and mm -hmm. um, I was slagging everybody in the room because you know, they were all expecting me to be a wimp I was coming in slagging because I knew they'd like to crack yeah. but whenever I slagged this fiend there was no laughs but I slagged everybody else to laugh and I had them eating out of the palm behind because I'm performing <laughs> you know what I mean slag him no laughs I was a bit of call you know, who's this fiend that's so anyway he did a scene with Clinchy and he's a better actor than Clinchy in the fucking scene right I said, ah. I said, come out to me, you, is this? Me real cheeky with this thing, right? Yeah. I said, come out to me, you. I said, who are you in the name of God? I said, do you ever act before? No, not technically, but kind of. And I went, okay, I'm getting the hints now. Right, grand. Psychotherapist gives me a nod. I said, all right, no bother. <laughs> ends the class, ends the oak, lets the man away. Psychotherapist goes over to me, do you know what that is? So anyway, I goes back in the screen, because I, I I met at my business, I got on them and said, I want to screen carbon gangsters in Mount Chai Prison. That's what I want to do with, you like the Johnny Cash thing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wanted to do that and give the lads fucking something and yeah. have a chat with all the boys, you know what I mean? And they all know the world. And also, a little bit of me wants to do a little stamp of approval as well, like, you know what I mean? Like, because yes. the lads fucking know, and I come up in the world, but they know more than me. Yeah. So, uh, 
I sit down in the front row and your man, the same fella, comes in and uh, he says, right, lads, shut the fuck up now when this film's on, right? This film is the most authentic betrayal of Dublin gangland culture ever. I saw it already on the telly. It's fucking amazing. All right, so sure up and don't be slagging, blah, blah, blah. And he sat down beside me. All right, John. I mean, we were like best friends at this day, right? <laughs> <laughs> I said, all right. And he was, I tell you how, like, he, he did a, like an acute awareness because he knew something was wrong with me. I don't know if I told you the rest of this, but so that morning, my brother had, had been put on fucking remand and he was arguing with fiends that were in there, they were bowel fiends, and I was going, with the um, next phone call, is my brother going to be cut up or something, do you know what I mean? I couldn't be anxiety, but I couldn't cancel on the fucking boys either, you know? He said, you all right? I said, yeah, no, I'm all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, not all right. He was just like a fucking psychologist, this game, right? Mm. I said, ah, well, that's uh, me. My brother, he's, uh, he's had to get him put on remand in, uh, in Wheatfield. Oh, yeah? You would? I said, yeah, I am a bit, to be honest. I am a bit worried, yeah. I said, because X, Y, and Z. All right, don't need to worry about that. That's grand. I said, what do you mean? That's nah, grand. I'm worried somebody over there. If he comes over here, look after him. I said, all right, nice one. Fuck. So so the film goes on, and the screening's going amazing. Now, I screened that film all across the world, all different continents, right? The scene where I punched through the wall, which was a scene that was improvised. It just happened in a moment. It was my real house. Um... Every time that's on, it's pure silence, right? The audience always go dead quiet, dead quiet. When it went on in the prison, they busted out laughing. One or two busted out laughing and they brought the rest of them to laugh. And I went, but the living house, that's a strange, yeah. that's a strange fucking reaction to that, like. And then I talked to the psychotherapist afterwards. So I said, so don't that reaction. I said, blah, 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 this never happened. Like, why did I get that reaction? Like, and she said, well, there was at least 10 murderers in the audience and that scene was about me being guilty over the murder and it caused the tension that made them laugh the and then created a kind of ricochet and exactly Fuck. so I found that fucking interesting, interesting isn't it? very interesting yeah um, but that was Mount Joy like yeah. but do, let me just go back to even, I don't know how far we are here I don't know yeah. just wanna, two or three minutes yeah I just want to pick up what you said that's perfect uh, acceptance man yeah. like accepting yourself Fuck me, it's hard. But yeah. when you do it, you're free. You will. Mm. And forgiving yourself. Mm. That's the thing that I found very hard in life. And I know I'm not a bad person, but still find it hard to forgive myself. Mm. And I think I'm getting there now, or getting to near there. Can I give you a small bit of advice? Yeah. Of forgiveness. Yeah. Draw forgiveness is not something that you, you, you can be telling yourself, I'm going to forgive myself tomorrow, or I'm going to forgive myself because you feel like you're hurting yourself all the time and you think it's time to forgive yourself. Forgiveness is about when something comes up that you've done and you feel the need that you have to forgive yourself over. It's not about saying, I'm going to forgive myself here. It's about feeling whatever that thing is that you yeah. need to forgive about. right? And every morning, it's about forgiving that person that's something, done something to you. It's about forgiving yourself for the stuff that you're beating yourself up. You do it on a daily basis, but you don't say, I'm going to forgive myself. No. You allow yourself to feel whatever it is you need to feel around the forgiveness. And you accept, you said it there, accept, you can accept yourself then. You need to firstly be able to leave it up and then accept it. Mm. And acceptance isn't another word that we use. I'm going to accept it. It's about sitting still and just saying, this is how it is. I can't change my situation. There's nothing can be done. This is how it is. And feel whatever's going on for you. Whatever thoughts are going on in your head, it's about accepting everything. Accepting the dog barking out the back, the rain pouring down and you want it to be sunny. Like, you have no control over what goes on in your head unless you, have, you want to tell yourself, I'm going to be a multimillionaire and keep saying that through aff aff affirmations. But... If there's negative thinking going on in your head and you're feeling a lot of shame, I can tell you this, there's no one standing over you with a puppeteer telling you, giving you shit or putting all this bad stuff. This is stuff that's going on for you. It's there to be felt. It's there to be understood. And you know the fighter that's in you, John? When that fighter knows what fights to pick, okay? See, all that stuff, it won't be an issue anymore because you'll accept it. And for men... For us to accept stuff, we have to allow ourselves to be vulnerable. 
And for that stuff, for you to forgive, you have to allow yourself to be vulnerable. I have to allow me to be vulnerable. We all do. And it's one of the tough thing, toughest things for men like us that grow up in areas where there's a lot of violence. Allow yourself to be vulnerable. And if you allow yourself to be vulnerable, you think you're going to be attacked or someone's going to hurt yeah. you. And you, you can't look weak. Yeah. But it's the only way to freedom, vulnerability, acceptance. And forgiveness is, the, is it frees your soul. Totally. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, okay, like, next No, time. that's good advice, man. I'm going to yeah. take that with me, Timmy. Oh, so Thank you. Just, it, it's, you're it's, so fucking right. It's how it happens for me. Yeah. I used to whip myself to death, John. Yeah. I had the worst, worst negative critical mind you could imagine. Like, I used to call myself some names. I was this, that, the other. You know, I felt like, I felt awful. I had no self-esteem, no confidence. I felt like I was a bad human being. And one day I just said, you know, I can't do nothing about it. And I sat there and I felt that pain in here. And I, this head up here that was calling me all these names, you're this, you're that, and the other, every form of thought. And I just sat through it and I felt it, you know. And in time, I started to use that as my tool to be able to accept myself. And there was no, never a word around acceptance, it's the word, but it's the action of just being still and just being. You know, no matter, no judgment on you or anything else going on in your life. Just be, just feel, just be, allow everything be as it is. And that's where you'll grow. And the vulnerability will come then. Because you'll catch yourself in situations where you would have been fought or not just people in your head. And you'll say, so, I put myself back here on and I'm just going to feel it. I can sit in here around the chair, I can feel it on my hamstrings. I can feel my feet in the floor. Mm. I can feel my back vibrating. And I'm accepting it. You know, I feel it, you know, because I'm in the spot right here, I feel it a little bit. You know, I'm in the spot and I just feel it. And everything that's coming out of my mouth, it's not recorded. It's not It's not pre-wrote or, or anything like that. It's stuff that's coming out of my mouth because it's through my own lived experience. And that's where the, f- the freedom for me came. It's through a lot of work. It's, it's an understanding. And you're very smart. Smart person, like intelligent, like emotionally intelligent. You know, accept yourself, not because you need to, because you you you, you should be. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, you should be. Nobody should be judging themselves. Yeah. No, fuck up. You exactly. Know. Totally. Feel it, and I can feel the hunger. Yeah. We we'll, we we'll call it. A day. I'm starving with hunger as well. Do you know what Travis says? Start with the Corollas. You know that. <laughs> Did you know that word, the Corollias? I never heard of it. Did you ever hear the Corollias? No. Wake with the Corollias. Did you ever hear eating the bagels? No. Yeah, like a, a bagel, starving. Like yeah. No, like endless pain. Yeah. That's what my right. And I don't know, I said, is that like a traveller version of diabetes you're talking about? <laughs> yeah. Or do you know Gaul Yun? Yeah, Gaul Yun, yeah. yeah. That's the story with the knock, you know. <laughs> do, you know, do you know the different words? I, yeah, yeah. I would have been wrong. We'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up before we yeah. go on again. Yeah. John. Been a pleasure. Lads, thanks very much, lads. That was special. Thank you. Thank you, lads. And uh, we've up the file, you know, career. Yes. Yes. We'll see everybody next week.